identify and avoid false teachers because that I think is the general theme that we're going to be looking at this evening. And there comes a time in all our lives, doesn't there, when even the most steadfast, resolved, dedicated servant of the Lord Jesus Christ will face times of hardship, will face times of frustration, temptation and despair. It, it comes to us all, doesn't it? And it's during these times that exhortation really plays a powerful part. Because it's during these times, those, those times of utter despair and, and loneliness, if you like, that we're most likely to falter. So chapters like this, the second epistle of Peter, uh, and in fact the, the first uh, chapter as well, and the one we're going to be looking at next week through Brother Paul, are reminders to us that life in the truth isn't always as smooth as perhaps we'd like it to be. Things are going to happen within the meeting, without the meeting, but things will happen to test our resolve, if you like. And it's apparent from the, the, the tone, the style and the language that Peter uses in his remarks to the believers that these things weren't lost on him. He knew these things were going to happen. And we shall see that we cannot be helped to be moved to a serious consideration of the way we interact with each other, um, the people around us, the people we have to work with. Um, we really have to think about how we interact um, and, of course, how we develop our relationship with the Lord God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, the subject this evening, the second epistle, General of Peter, and chapter 2. Just look at the preface for us at, at the beginning of that chapter. It says, of false teachers showing the punishment of them and their followers, from which the godly shall be delivered, as Lot was, out of Sodom. Now, I suggest that this chapter is particularly relevant to us today, because false teachers are everywhere, aren't they? They're cunningly disguised, false teachers. The very fact that our children are being taught the fact of evolution as it's proclaimed that our, our church leaders, the so-called Church of England, are teaching about immortal souls. False teachers are everywhere around us, but we wouldn't expect to find them within the ecclesia, would we? Yes, our time is different to that of Peter's. It's a very different time indeed, but the problems that we face, even though they're different, it's a cliche, but they're very much the same. And he warns them of the dangers of following after false prophets. The whole chapter uh, of this second epistle, the whole epistle in fact, it's almost an exhortation in chapter 1, a warning in chapter 2, and then a reassurance, a building back up if you like, in chapter 3. And it's a reminder to us that we can learn and benefit from the mistakes of others in the scriptures. They are a great motivator for doing good. So, our objectives this evening. We're going to have a very brief outline of chapter 2, just to remind ourselves of what happened uh, last week, just in case we weren't here or, or we need a refresher. We're going to have a look at the background to chapter 2, the chapter under consideration this evening. We're going to have a look at the general theme of, of the chapter. So, let's remind ourselves then of the, of the outline of the chapter. I'm presuming these are coming up, yes. Chapter 1. We're, we're encouraged, aren't we? And, and Brother Andrew brought it out beautifully for us last week to cultivate a godly character. We have the seven virtues that he mentioned that grow out of a living faith. We have the virtue, excellence and praise, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness and charity. And, and Brother Andrew went into those as part of our study and, and we gained great comfort from that. The second chapter then, to identify and to avoid false teachers. That's what we're going to be looking at this evening. And then next week, God willing, we'll be looking at preparing the believer for the coming day of God. And these letters, are in that, in that vibe, are a great source of encouragement and help for us. And, and they're the sort of things that we should be reading often. Because they come from a, a brother that was, wanted us to be encouraged in our most holy faith the Apostle Peter. We might not see the benefit in these things at first, but when we consider that we are weak, we're sinful creatures before our Almighty God, we need to appreciate and take on board any help we can get, don't we? 
no matter how uncomfortable that may seem to us at first. So that's our thoughts for this evening, in, in, identify and avoid false teachers. So we've looked at the outline of the second Peter chapter 2, just to, to refresh our minds. We're now going to look very much at the, at the background. To when and whom was it written? The second epistle in chapter 2, and where from? Again, Brother Andrew touched on this a little bit last week. Um, but it is very interesting because it's not as straightforward as we might expect. There are disputes over the authorship, over the date, the location, uh, and indeed who it was written to. Now, much of the um, commentaries that can be viewed online or in books dispute the date. They, they say it can be anywhere between 60 and 160 AD. Um, but it's clear that if we're assuming that Peter was the author, and that, that is one of the, the arguments, that Peter wasn't actually the author, but if we go to the second of Peter in chapter 3, and verse 1, he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. So, he's saying it himself. He's telling us here that he is the author. So we have no reason to doubt that Peter is the author of this second epistle. Um, regarding the date, um, we suspect it was round about... Um, well, he certainly wrote before AD 65, because he was martyred in um, round about October 64. He probably wrote from Rome. Um, we can see that from the first of Peter, chapter 5, verse 3. So just have a very quick look at that. It's actually verse 13. Chapter 5, verse 13. He says, The church that it is Babylon, elect together with you, saluteth you. So he code names where he's writing from as Babylon. And most commentators agree that that is in fact Rome. And he just didn't want to be acknowledged at being at Rome at that time. Thirdly, um, this letter, uh, this epistle, is one of the last to be included in the canon of Scripture. Um, because he refers extensively to the epistles of Paul. Again, 2nd of Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Halfway through the verse he says, Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of some things which are some, etc, etc. So he's, he's referring to the epistles that Paul has already written. So this, this book, this letter is certainly quite late introduction into the canon of scripture. We have a very strong um, comparison with the epistle of Jude. There's no denying it, if you read Jude and you read the second epistle of Peter in chapter 2 in particular, there is a very strong link between the two books. Um, and again, we can confirm that round about the same time, because Jude does exactly the same thing. In, in verse 17 of his epistle, he says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, he's referring to the epistles that were already written. So certainly Jude was perhaps a little bit after, well we know Jude was after the second Peter chapter 2, so they were very much related in time as well as content. Now, this first epistle, we need to remember as well, was written during a period of severe trials for the believers, the disciples of Christ. There was great persecution going on, um, the fire of Rome um, happened in, I think it was AD 62, um, and he blamed the Jews. So they were under great persecution um, from all angles, if you like, from, from the Romans and, and from the people that di just didn't like Christians. And then, of course, we had the second coming that hadn't happened. You've got to remember that the Christians at this time assumed, wrongly as we know, that the second coming of Christ was imminent. It was going to be soon. They thought that they, Christ would come and overthrow the Romans. And it just didn't happen. And so Peter is now having to deal with this. Um, that this, this worry, this frustration, this concern that must have gone on in the Ecclesia. Now the second of Peter, like the first of Peter, was written to remind them of essential truths. And these things must be acknowledged by the believer. Uh, and they're found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And they are reminded of them often throughout the epistle, which we'll pick up on. Again, just have a look at chapter 3 
and the first two verses. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour. So he's really emphasising the fact that they need to remember, to recall the things that went on in the past. And we've got to do the same, haven't we? We have the whole canon of scripture at our disposal now in a complete form and and we need to use it. So, the background to chapter 2 has been dealt with. We're going to have a look now um, at the general theme of the chapter. And like I say, we've titled this section, Identify and Avoid False Teachers. We're told that in verses 1 to 3, we have a a breakdown here of the, the fact that false teachers shall arise, and they will be governed by covetousness and lasciviousness, and, and we'll pick that up in a few moments. Then we have, we're given from verses uh, 4 to 9, three historical examples illustrating judgment upon the wickedness and the deliverance of the righteous. And then, from verses 10 to 22, so these are three natural divisions within the chapter, how to identify these false teachers. And we're going to be spending most of our time in that that first section, the first three verses, because I think most of the other um, issues have been dealt with in in some detail, but I'd like to pick up in the words and the language that is used in the first of uh, second of Peter and the first three verses. But before we go on, I just want us to consider a little bit further this relationship between the second of Peter chapter two and Jude. Um, like I say, you cannot read these two things without seeing remarkable similarities. Um, I, I, some time ago I, I did a talk on Jude. I hadn't actually done one on Peter, so now I've done the two. I can marry them together and perhaps we could have a, a Jude and Peter study one evening. I don't know. Um, there is an awful lot to go into and, and like I say, it is a study on its own. Um, but there are many suggestions as to why this relationship happened. Why does it appear that Jude is extensively, and he does, quote from the second of Peter chapter 2? I spent quite a bit of time looking into this, um, and I was going to go into some detail, but there was no real um, benefit, if you like. It was just a study, so I decided against it. Um, But really, suffice to say that I, having looked into this, believe now that it was Jude... Actually, let's just go back a bit. Go back to the second of Peter and chapter 5 and verse 12. We have there, Peter says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. So we know from that remark that it was Silvanus that was the scribe. Now I suspect that Jude was the scribe for Peter in this second epistle, and particularly chapter 2. Now, the reason I think that is because if Jude was writing a letter to to the people he wanted to write to, and, and if you just have a quick look at Jude, look at the first couple of verses. Actually, verse 3. We'll go in at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, so that's what he was going to write to them about, the common salvation that they, that they needed to hear. But he says, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. So, I, I get the idea that Jude had an affinity with the second epistle. If Jude was indeed the scribe, and he wrote these things down, these things would have been fresh in his mind. And so when he's writing, and if he is writing to the same brethren and and sisters, then he's really just confirming what has already happened. Because Jude is in the present, whereas the second of Peter chapter 2 is in, uh, it's it's looking forward to those things, It's, it's prophetic. And so I think Jude felt so close to this chapter and the brethren that he wrote to, having having actually written the epistle himself, or penned the epistle I should say, he felt compelled to then change his tone of his letter to reinforce what Peter had said and to give them extra advice and encouragement. 
Like I said, there's many, many different views, but that, that's the view I ended up settling on. So, false teachers shall arise, verses 1 to 3. Now, Peter starts his prophetic warning. Let's have a look then. Second epistle of Peter and chapter 2. And verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false, pro- false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. There's a lot going on there, isn't there? That's quite a big verse, and there's a lot of words that we don't really use here in the 21st century. But we notice that it's a common theme. The Apostle Paul also warned of false teachers, didn't he? Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. Acts chapter 20, verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember. So the same kind of theme is coming through here, isn't it? Watch and remember. There's going to be this contrast between falseness and truth. You notice there as well in that verse that we just read. And in fact over the the first two verses, the word shall. It's used four times. It's an emphasis. For some reason, Peter knew these things were going to happen. And the reason being, of course, he'd been told. So these things were prophetic. But notice what he does. He distances himself from the false, pro- false prophets. He's almost saying, if you like, there were false prophets that gave false advice. But the advice I'm going to give you is true. There will be false teachers. Be prepared. And so, just as Paul did when he was writing to the Ephesians in Acts, he says, I know this. These things had been revealed to him. They would not be prophets. They would not be claiming to to predict anything. They would be teachers. They would be false teachers working from within the ecclesia. It's Peter that's the prophet on this occasion. And Jeremiah 28 and verse 9, Jeremiah himself declares that when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. And so these things we know now are true because we have the epistle of Jude. Jude confirms these things actually took place. We're not prophets, are we? We're not told to be prophets, but we are told to teach. And as teachers, then this message is especially relevant to us, isn't it? We're we're told to go out and preach the gospel to any that will listen. The good news concerning the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ, his son. Did you notice that word there? Privily. Privily comes from the Greek word parasego. Now that suggests something that's craftily done that's stealthily done, that's done with intent to implant one's own will or one's own moral code on somebody else. And these brethren that were going to arise were openly preaching the truth, but in effect they were denying the power thereof. And Timothy warns of those, doesn't he, in the second of Timothy chapter 3 verse 5, where he says they had a form of godliness, but they denied the power thereof. From such, turn away. Have nothing to do with them. So Peter's really just reinforcing these things, knowing that these things were going to come within the ecclesia. But sadly, again, from Jude, we know that that wasn't going to happen here, that they would become part of the ecclesia. The word damnable heresies. Again, words we're not really in our modern day speak, are they? It's not words we use every day. Now, damnable there comes from the Greek word apolia, and it means utter destruction. And it gives the example um, of a clay pot, and we think again of Jeremiah's earthen vessel. When it was smashed, it was useless, and, and God was prophesying what was going to happen to Israel. You can't do anything with a clay pot that's smashed. It will never be a clay pot again, will it? And so... That's what they were going to do. They were utterly going to destroy the faith of the believers. 
And heresy, the word heresy there, is the word sect. And it gives the idea uh, of when an army storms a city, if you like, um, they would leave nothing of any use. They're like locusts going through a, a field. They devastate one's religion by eating away at their beliefs. That's the kind of language that Peter was using to describe what was going to happen. And so they should be on their guard. And so we have to ask the question, because we're talking about brothers and sisters that were baptised into the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How could a follower of Christ get into this state? What had gone wrong in their lives? Were they never truly converted? Were they just longing for the past life that they used to have and, and the pleasures that they had? It sounds almost absurd, doesn't it, that, that that could happen now. But we know too sadly that it does. Now, I just want to read you um, something here from Brother Mansfield's comment on this. He says, Peter is evidently referring to the erroneous, erroneous views that some would introduce relating to the person and sacrifice of Christ. The doctrine of substitu substitution, which early became widespread throughout the ecclesias and defeats the doctrine of personal sacrifice. If Jesus died instead of us, then there is no need for us to die. That was the mentality. They proclaimed the doctrine of doing evil that good may come. Having been delivered through Christ from the condemnation of the law, they imagined that they were a law unto themselves and that all restrictions for them had ceased. Thus they denied the right of the Lord or Master that brought them. Obsessed with this theory that grace would provide a cover for all sins, they gave themselves over to unstinted gratification of the flesh. Of Paul wrote... Of these, Paul wrote, their damnation is just. True doctrine of the atonement not only reveals the mercy of God in forgiving sins, but his justice in demanding that sins be forsaken. And that's not what they were doing. So what a state of mind to be in. And remember, these things were happening from within the ecclesia. Not other denominations, not other religions, but from within the ecclesia. Those kind of things would be easy to deal with, wouldn't they? We, we get a Jehovah's Witness come through the door, we know how to deal with that, we are prepared. But from within, when you don't know the brethren that are doing these things, and yet a sad indictment that these things would happen. And we know they happen because Jude tells us. We've just had a look at Jude 4, so I won't go there again. But they crept in unawares. Actually, we will. Jude, chapter, uh, Jude verse 4. There's something else I want to pick out on, on this. Right, Jude verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and dying, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude there is talking in the present tense. He's telling them that these brethren crept in unawares and so we have a situation where we have ungodly brothers deceiving genuine brothers, if you like, if, that, if that's the correct word. But using and this is the key word, lasciviousness. How many of us really know and understand what lascivious means? That was a question, but yeah, you don't have to answer it. It's not a word or a term that we use at all, really, is it? Lasciviousness in our everyday language. Um, but if you go back to the second of Peter and the first... the second chapter and the first verse we read... Uh, sorry, the second verse, it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now that word pernicious is the word destroying. If you look at your margin there, where it says pernicious, in my margin it says, las or lasciviousness ways, as some copies read. And so we have a situation 
where this word lasciviousness crops up in Jude. It started off as pernicious, a destroying way, and it ended up in Jude as lasciviousness. So I think we need to find out what lascivious means. It comes from the Greek word aselgia. Um, and these are some of the descriptions of the word. Unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness, wantonness, outrageousness, shameless and innocence. Again, not really words that we're too familiar with. So what I've done, I've took a, a commentary from the internet um, on the word lasciviousness. And I just want to read this because it really brings it up for us, up to date for us and, and our situation. What is lasciviousness? Lasciviousness is aselgia. It occurs nine times in the New Testament. Lasciviousness is a gross form of wickedness that has sexual overtones in many cases. It starts in a sinful heart, Mark chapter 7 verse 21, and manifests itself in fleshly carnal actions, Galatians chapter 5 verse 19, and can lead to a state of being past feeling or past caring, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 19. The word can connote several attitudes or actions. With reference to sexual matters, however, it embraces the concept of excess, unbridled lust, debauchery, sensuality. It suggests a disregard for public decency. The word conveys the idea of a person who is so far gone in lust and desire that he or she ceases to care what people think or say. For example, it describes the moral environment of ancient Sodom and Gomorrah. And we read of that in, in our epistle here, chapter 2, verse 7, where he says, And deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And that word filthy is lasciviousness. It was sexual connotation in that language that he was vexed with. Lasciviousness occurs frequently in the workplace where men, and this is bringing it up to date for us, where men and women are constantly thrown together in close contact. Flirting, suggestive touching, language containing sexual innuendo, sexual humour, provocative dress are all forms of lasciviousness behaviour and conduct that very often lead to fornication and adultery. Those who take the scripture seriously will personally abstain from such practices. The lascivious person will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. To ignore the biblical warnings is the epitome of folly. So I can see there that we get an idea of the kind of problem that had erupted or that was certainly going to erupt uh, at the time of Peter's writing. There was definitely a, a, a sexual element, a, a perverseness if you like, going on within the ecclesias. So if we're right, and Jude was indeed writing to the same brethren that Peter was writing to, we get a picture of really what's happening. And it's not really a nice discussion, is it, to have. But it was a reality. So it's something that was going to happen to them. Brothers taking advantage of brothers' wives. Having affairs. Committing adulteries. How often have we seen this in the world? And how often have we seen it in the ecclesias? We're not exclusive to these things. These things can happen to anybody. Just because we're in the truth doesn't mean to say these things won't happen to us. We have to be on our guard. We've seen families torn apart, haven't we? Relationships ended and destroyed. Once loving relationships destroyed. And it starts with the company we keep, doesn't it? Out, out of our environment here. The things that we allow ourselves to see on our tellies, listen to on our radios, read in our magazines and newspapers. All these things will have an effect on us. And they will turn us away from God. Because if they like, I've said this before, but they will desensitise us. And we will, we, will be, we will adopt their moral standards. Our standards will be lowered. And that's exactly what was going to happen. The ecclesia was not strong enough to deal with these brethren that were coming in and imposing their views, what they thought was right. So these brethren had no shame. They were almost celebrating what they did. And because of this, we read, to at the end of verse 2, the way of the truth shall 
the evil spoken of. And that word, evil spoken of, is the word blasphemo. And we know what word we get from that, blaspheme. They were blaspheming their, 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 the truth. They were blas blaspheming the truth. And if you're like me and you get offended when you hear people using God's name in vain or, or Jesus' names in vain, when it happens all the time, it happens regularly on telly now, doesn't it? It seems commonplace. Nobody seems to care anymore. We're like a minority that are weird if we get offended by such things. But I think these verses show us that perhaps our offence should be a little more widespread, that we should feel more disturbed by the things we hear. We know that Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, but he still chose to live there. It was his choice. He didn't move out. He could have made himself separate like Abraham did, but he didn't. He chose to live there. And in the end, the, the choice was made for him, wasn't it? Partly through the intercession of Abraham. Are we the same? How much time do we deliberately put ourselves in situations that we know are uncomfortable, that we know we shouldn't be in? Because all these things will, will chip away at our belief and our resolve to serve God in the way that we know we should. So we need to look inwardly. Verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So they're given more warning. They had lost the fear of the Lord. And this, what happens when, when this happens is that the body of believers, if they're unchecked, disobedience and sin will prevail. That word, covetousness, it comes from the Greek word pleonikasa. Hmm, and it literally means they had an unhealthy desire for material gain. That's the definition of the word, covetousness. An unhealthy desire for material gain. That's what fueled their every action. They weren't fueled by the truth, what the truth was telling them to do. They were fueled by material gain. They'd lost their love of the truth. And again, Paul exhorts us previously, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, exactly the same. He says, withdraw from them. It's a command. Withdraw from these people. They will not be any good for you. The other word there that we looked at was feigned, wasn't it? Again, what's feigned? It's not a word that we use in our schools or in our homes. But when we see what the word means, this is really interesting. It comes from the Greek, Greek word, plastos. And I think you can see what word we get from that word. We get our word plastic. Now, if you've ever tried to reshape something from plastic, what happens? Nothing. You can't reshape plastic, can you? If you heat it, it moulds into some kind of weird shape that you didn't want it to mould into. It's a set piece, a set object that's designed for a set purpose, and it stays like that. If it loses that shape, it becomes useless. And, and that's basically what, they, what these brethren were going to think of their words and their doctrines, that they were unmovable. They believed them, so much so that they enforced them on everybody. They were convinced that they were right. So we're not talking about brethren here who are deliberately trying to deceive other brethren. They were convinced that they were doing the right thing. As we've just read, that they actually believed that they were doing the right thing. Now what's really interesting is, if you go back to Genesis, and Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we have um, the comment about when we were made. When we were formed from the dust of the earth. And that word formed is a, is a really nice Hebrew word actually. It's really nice to say. It's yatsar. Um, and that means to be fashioned, to be framed or to be preordained for a set purpose. And of course when we apply that to ourselves in a spiritual sense it's a wonderful contrast to what we have of these brethren, isn't it? We were fashioned and framed and preordained to serve God. 
for a purpose. We were given a mind that can, can learn to read, can learn to communicate, can show love and empathy. All these things were done for us. And those things now have been lost on these brethren. They were determined to, to impose their own will. They didn't like the authority of being told what to do. They were trying to deceive using unbendable words. And the only way to destroy plastic is in fire. And so we think of the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 19 and 20. That will be their destruction at the second judgment. They were moulded by their selfish desires. Because it's easier to provide for yourself than to provide for others, isn't it? It's easy to look after yourself. You know what you want. But to, to look after somebody else, that takes effort. You have to ask. You have to pay attention to somebody else to understand what their needs are. These were not interested in that. It was self-desire, self-gratification, self-fulfilment. And remember, this was going on within the ecclesia. Not externally, within. They were not content with choosing to live their life, their conceited lives, on their own. They wanted to convert the whole body of believers to their way of thinking. So they were very dangerous. The other word there that we, we looked at was merchandise. And that word comes from emporiomai which is our word emporium. And the inference there is that they were only really there to trade, um, to deal, or to use a person for a thing of gain. And then when we think of the sexual connotations that we looked at earlier with lasciviousness, with that in their minds, what were they trying to do? Well, they prostituted their freedom in Christ, hadn't they? For worldly gain and prosperity and notoriety. That's what the level they had sunk to. What a sad state of affairs. Let's be warned. Let's be on our guard against these things. The second section then. That's most of our time in, in that section. The second section is... We're given the three examples then of the historical events that took place from Jewish history. And we're not going to look at these in any detail. They have been extensively covered. We all know about the angels that sinned. And we certainly know about Sodom and Gomorrah and, and we know about Noah. Suffice to say that all three are his recorded historical events from the Bible. Nothing made up. So we know the angels that sinned is not something that Peter plucked up out of the air to try and confuse the readers. They knew and they would have known exactly what he was talking about. So let's have no doubt about that, just as they would about Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. It was in their scriptures and they could have referred to it. So the whole point of this was to remind the reader that divine judgment would always prevail. God punishes evil, but ultimately delivers the righteous. Sometimes it will be instant, as it was with Korodath and Abiram, uh, and, and the world under and, uh, and Noah, and Sodom and Gomorrah. God has that right, and they are reserved unto judgment. But they were real, practical warnings, and the readers would know them, they would recognise them, and they would take comfort and reassurance from them, just as we should when we read them. And so with that said, we can affirm that the angels that sinned, in verse 4, must relate, as Noah and Sodom do, to real events. So real, actual events. And, and we've identified that, haven't we, as being Korah, Dathan and Abiram. In Numbers chapter 16, the uprising against Moses. Now why this is really interesting is because this particular event follows on directly from verse 3. And in verse 3, Peter was talking about whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. He's talking about the delaying of judgment. And that is exactly what happened to Korah, Dathan and Abiram, isn't it? They gathered themselves up against Moses, and they were punished. We've just been given a description in verse 3 of the type of people that would rise up and challenge the ecclesia. That's what Korah, Dathan and Abiram did. They rose up and they challenged Moses. And so the, the next verse, the next verse after that, takes us to Moses. It's not in chronological order. We've got the angels that sinned first, then we have Noah and then we have Sodom. 
But the reason for that is because he was talking about the delaying of judgment in verse 3. So how relevant then that this verse follows on directly from verse 3. They didn't respect leadership and they wanted to go their own way. And so we have a striking parallel there. So, the general theme. How to identify false teachers. And this section covers verses 10 to 22. Again, we're not going to spend much time with this at all. But we're going to run through them quite quickly. Just one verse we're going to pick out, verse 10. Because um, again, there's a lot of words in there that I think we, should, we need to explore to really understand what was going on. So let's have a look at verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, that they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Those who serve the body in preference to the mind. It was all about gratification of the flesh. They pleased themselves and they deny any restriction that stopped them from doing that. Anybody that was opposed to them doing what they wanted to do, they didn't want to have anything to do with. They despised government. Now what's interesting is that word government in verse 10 comes from the Greek word kriotes, which is dominion, which is not what we, we wouldn't unexpect that, would we? But it denotes power, lordship, one who possesses dominion and denying any form of discipline. And so again, how interesting is it that that relates back to Korah, Dathan and Abiram? That's exactly what they stood for. They challenged Moses, didn't they? His leadership. His direction, even though they knew it was from God. That is why they were destroyed. And that is why they've been reserved for judgment. So we can, we're building up a picture of the type of people that P Peter was talking about and referring to when he was referring to Korah, Dathan and Abiram. The word presumptuous there in that verse. It's daring or headstrong. Again, that's exactly what Korah, Dathan and Abiram were. Arrogant, self-willed, conjures up the idea of being arrogant, an idea of self-importance. And, and that is the, the attitude that prevailed in their life. And again, Korah, Dathan and Abiram. So that follows on beautifully from verse 3, doesn't it? And then we have that word again. It's actually the same word, blasphemo. Speak evil of. Blaspheme. They would speak evil of dignities. Now that word dignities, again, comes from the Greek word doxa, which is a word that denotes commanding respect. 145 times, though, it is recorded as glory. So in the Bible, when you read that word doxa, 145 times, it's glory. I think it's about two or three times it's doxa. So, in effect, they were blaspheming the glory that separated them from the world. Because originally they came out of the world, didn't they? Just like the other brothers and sisters. But now they're blaspheming that glory that drew them out of the world. And now they're returning to their corrupt ways. Again, a very, very sad situation. I think we're getting a very clear picture of the problems that were going to arise. And, and we know they did arise because of, of Jude. Many more descriptions within, within those verses there of, of false teachers and, and conveying the, the kind of attitude that they needed to be wary of. Time really doesn't permit us to uh, look into those in any detail. So I'm going to try and draw our thoughts to a conclusion now. I, w I want to round off by um, taking some thoughts perhaps to exhort us on our journey. What can we benefit from this letter, the second chapter of the epistle? We know that living the truth can be difficult. We all have our own problems. We all know of problems of, of other brethren and sisters. But Peter had given this ecclesia, these brethren, the tools to identify and deal with false teachers. And we know from Jude that they had failed to use them effectively, hadn't they? They hadn't used the tools that they had. But we must be different. Peter gave them an example of the past through those three historical thoughts. And that should have motivated them. That should have made them appreciate what was going to happen, how serious it was. 
and we have those examples too but we have more we have as we said the whole canon of scripture we need to have done the background don't we it's no good just coming to the truth um, and just being baptised and hoping that's it we need to put the effort in just like the readers of this epistle were encouraged to fill their minds with the things that were right to oppose evil he warns them and us in verse 20 have a look at verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than from the beginning so he's basically saying there's no turning back once you put your hand to the plough you can't go back what they had was precious. It was life-changing. It was, it was God-given. It was inspired truth, life-saving truth. But they had turned away from it. It's not enough, brothers and sisters, just to abhor sin, to hate sin, which we all do. On so many levels, it's so prevalent around us, isn't it? But we have to put on the righteousness. We have to allow that to work in our mortal bodies to help us prepare to be fitting vessels for the kingdom. Filling our minds, if you like, with, with the knowledge of the truth and then living that life that comes from that knowledge. Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And that echoes the warning in chapter, in verse 21. Peter says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, rather than, than after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. It is knowledge that is the grounds for responsibility, isn't it? It's not just baptism, it's knowledge. Many make the mistake of thinking once they're baptised, they can, to use a boxing analogy, just hang their gloves up. It's not the case. We have to develop. We have to become more Christ-like, more spiritual. We have to grow in the truth. Dogs and pigs. Why have I put dogs and pigs on the screen? Verse 22. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed in her wallow in the mire. Under the law, dogs and swine were unclean. How they act is natural to them. What they do is natural to them. A pig will wallow in the mud. And a dog will return to his vomit. That's why Peter uses them as examples and the proverb used them as examples. But both of them are very interesting creatures. They're very intelligent creatures. They say that you can train a pig and a dog very much the same. In fact, they say a pig is more intelligent than a dog. And we know how clever dogs can be. But, without constant training, eventually that dog and that pig will return to the way that they know. The natural brute beast that they are. Unless they are constantly being retrained and, and, and trained, and, and that training is reinforced, they will revert back. And so, to use the analogy, we must also grow. We must train our minds to perform God's will and not our own natural will. Let us not be turned. Let us be prepared through the filling of our minds and the filling of our time because that's just as important, isn't it? To be ready to find the truth that was once delivered unto us. I'll just finish by reading the last bit of Jude, Jude verse 20 but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the most holy in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, verse 24 now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.